Good afternoon and uh, welcome to a specially called meeting of the Cab County Board of Commissioners Finance Audit and Budget Committee. I'm Commissioner Jeff Rader serving as chair of the committee and uh, we are also joined by committee member uh, Commissioner Larry Johnson um, as well as Commissioner Ted Terry, our colleague on the board. Um, thank you all for making time and also for staff and others in attendance. Um, I would uh, like to start the uh, agenda by considering the minutes. Um, Commissioner Johnson, have you had a chance to review the minutes of May 10th? Yes, sir. And I'll uh, make a motion to approve those minutes. Um, thank you. And I'll second that motion. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Um, that is our first uh, item of business. The second item of business is a great honor in so far as we have uh, the opportunity to um, interview a candidate uh, for um, county probate court associate uh, judge. Um, and so let's see, is uh, Judge Freeman or uh, um, Madam Candidate, thank you for being here today and also for uh, our Chief Judge uh, Hargrove uh, being here with her. Um, we also will uh, be interested after, well, first perhaps, um, Judge Hargrove, could you give us a uh, brief um, summary of uh, this expansion of the capacity of the probate court? I certainly can. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me this afternoon. I am here today with a walk-on item that I believe has been sponsored by Commissioner Larry Johnson, and it is a request uh, to appoint an associate judge for the DeKalb County Probate Court. It's a position that's uh, vital to the probate court. Um, for those of you who may recall, I actually uh, joined DeKalb County uh, back in for about January of 2017 in the capacity as the associate judge of the probate court. And then very soon thereafter, March 1st of 2017, I became the judge of the probate court and I have not had an associate judge um, up to this point, I have not even requested an associate judge up to this point because I needed to get in to the court and see all of the things that were going on with the court and make a whole lot of changes which have been made. It's, it's evident they've been made. And so I've come to the point now where it's time for me to request the appointment of an associate judge. So I was very proactive with this. I requested it in my budget for 2022. It was in fact approved in my budget for 2022, the associate judge position, which was an existing vacancy. It has been funded uh, at the amount of $129,377. So I'm simply here today um, asking for the commissioner's approval of not only the candidate that I have selected, uh, strategically selected, because it's someone who's actually worked with me and under me since 2017 and has learned um, my style of managing and running a court and has done a great job assisting me with that um, management of the court. And I will also note that uh, her assistance was vital during all of 2020 and 2021, more importantly, because of the pandemic and having to work um, and provide in-person services to the citizens of DeKalb County throughout the entire pandemic. We were not uh, permitted to shut our offices down at all or everybody work remote. We were here at the courthouse and we were receiving customers consistently. And uh, Caroline Freeman was here with me every step of that way to, to manage this court and make it run as efficiently as it is running. And so I think that she is certainly qualified for the position. And I think that she, um, in fact, in, in my opinion, maybe it might not be the right word, but so be it. I think she, in fact, deserves the position of the associate judge. And that's just based upon my opinion of having run the court since um, 2017. So if you need anything else from me, I'll be happy to answer any questions, but I'll let um, Caroline Freeman speak for her credentials because she certainly has some good ones. Thank you uh, for that introduction. And um, just uh, as clarification, uh, Ms. Freeman is your nominee to this position. This is not a 13A 
appointment under our organizational act that would be the purview of the um, CEO. Instead, this is your direct nomination. Is that true? That is correct. It is pursuant to official code of Georgia, section 15-9-2.1, which states that the probate court may appoint one or more persons to serve as an associate judge. And of course, that requires um, subject to the approval of the governing authority. So it is absolutely positively my nomination. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, with that as uh, uh, context, um, I welcome you, uh, Ms. Freeman, to, um, to come before us, and certainly uh, you come on high recommendation. Um, before we uh, pose a couple of uh, standard interview questions to you, I'd like to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself to the Board of Commissioners and uh, give us uh, your opening statement. Thank you, Commissioner Rader. It's my honor to be here this afternoon. And first, thanks to Judge Hargrove for this, this nomination as Associate Judge. I am a DeKalb resident of over 35 years, a proud graduate of the DeKalb school system, and I went to Georgia Tech and then received my law degree at Georgia State and also my master's in public administration. I went to law school because of my interest in estate planning, probate, and elder law, and was fortunate enough to study under the professor who helped write the laws for the state of Georgia. Um, during my law school career, I had the opportunity to work with the Council on Aging and Atlanta Legal Aid Senior Citizens Law Project, and I also interned here at the probate court. And um, in 2010, I like to say I joined the payroll. I came on board as the law clerk, and my role has evolved over the past 12 years. Um, I've learned a little bit about everything this court does. It is near and dear to my heart, and I'm currently serving as the chief clerk and a hearing officer. Thank you very much. That is a great uh, summary. And also, um, your resume has been circulated. It is likewise impressive. And we certainly appreciate um, your service to the cab and your consideration of this appointment. Um, Commissioner Larry Johnson, um, do you have the interview questions before you? Yes, sir. Would you care to kick us off? Yes, sir. I will do it. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Freeman, for coming before us uh, and serving and wanting to serve in a great capacity on the, I think, one of the best chief probate judges in the world, Judge Hargrove, but your your experience from Georgia Tech, and I saw you had the, uh, you got the public policy background from Andy Young School of Public Policy, and you served Atlanta Legal Aid, and that's one of the, uh, I mean, diehard groups that really get out there and work for the people, so your background uh, is, is tremendous. And I have a question just uh, as, a, as DeKalb County is one of the most populous and diverse counties in the state of Georgia, which is, what is your judicial philosophy with regard to how you address the services of the probate court? I, I want to serve everyone that, that needs our services. That I am passionate about, um, about service, whether it's we're responding in a timely manner, um, hearing people out, giving them their day in court. I want um, to, to be fair and impartial and, and reach a decision that's in the best interest of the, of the parties. I do a tremendous number of adult guardianship hearings, and that's where we're dealing with incapacitated adults. And so in those cases, that is my sole focus. What is in the best interest of that person? And how can we serve that person and meet their needs where they are? OK, thank you so much. Thank you. We have several other commissioners on the line with us. Um, I wonder if e any of them have the interview questions before you, and if you'd be interested in asking questions, uh, Commissioner Terry. Mr. Chair, um, I actually didn't have, a, I didn't want to answer, ask one from the interview questions, but I did want to ask kind of sort of a, maybe a procedural question about mm -hmm. the, the, the functionality of the new constitutional carry that's sort of indicating folks don't have to get gun permits. Is that going to affect our probate court directly, or is that a totally separate issue? I think that's a Judge uh, Hargrove uh, question. So let's uh, get done with the interview, and then you can pose that question. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let me take the next one, because I realize that probably the other committee uh, commissioners uh, didn't get the um, uh the uh, questions and or they may not be in front of you. Um, and this is a simple one. Why is being a judge important to you? Mm -hmm. 
been, I am, as I said, I am passionate about, about service and serving my community. I come from a family of a minister and a teacher. And so that's always been important. My path was just through the law and not um, education or theology. And so um, I want to serve in whatever capacity I can. And this has been, been my career path and I want to continue it. Thank you. Judge, uh, Commissioner Johnson. Yes, sir. What does judicial independence mean to you? Um, judicial independence, um, to me, it means when I when I go into a case, I am um, I've I've reviewed, I've prepared, I've studied both sides. No um, no outside influence on me. I want to sit and hear, listen, take in all the evidence, and then make the best decision possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then um, a standard question that we ask all candidates, are there any extenuating circumstances or potential reasons for recusal that could preclude or impede your service to the probate, probate court? No, none that I'm aware of. No. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions um, pertaining to the judge's candidacy that we might want to answer uh, from either members of the committee or others? Seeing none, I think that you've acquitted yourself well in the interview and um, in the course of our business, uh, we will be making a recommendation to the Board of Commissioners. So again, thank you for being here today. Um, we will uh, turn our attention back to Judge Hargrove for Commissioner Terry's question. Okay, um, I believe that Commissioner Terry was asking about the impact on the constitutional carry law that recently passed and what impact that will have on um, the Cab County probate court and all probate courts for that matter. The impact that it has had is that it has reduced the number of uh, weapon carry applications that we are receiving. Um, at this time, up to this point this year, we have processed 2,700 weapon carry license applications. And last year, in 2020 and 2021, by this time, we likely would have processed approximately 6,000. So the number has gone down um, over the last couple of months. I have no idea what's going to happen beyond um, the next couple of months. But um, I will say that uh, I don't give advice about anything because I'm a judge and I'm not supposed to give anybody any, any advice about anything. But I will say that um, I think it's a misnomer for someone to believe that because of the constitutional carry legislation that they no longer might need a weapon carry license to carry, especially if they're going to leave the state of Georgia. So I'll just, uh, I'll say that small piece of it. And I'll also state that um, I was very much integrally involved in the entire constitutional carry um, case that occurred. It was Bell versus Hargrove. I was the probate court judge who denied a weapons carry license application. I was the probate court judge that was sued. I was the probate court judge who had great county attorneys representing me, and they did a fabulous job arguing for me. And um, the Supreme Court made the decision that the Supreme Court made, and I'll have to respect that. Thank you. Commissioner Terry, any other questions? No, thank you very much, Judge Harker. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Well, again, thank you uh, both for appearing before us today, and we will continue on with our agenda and um, then uh, take action at the appropriate time. Okay. Thank um, you for having us. I'm going to stick around just briefly, but thank you for having us and have a great day, everyone. Sure thing. Thank you. Um, let's see, the next agenda item is a purchasing item, item 1545, uh, sole source procurement of maintenance and support for benchmark court management, uh, court case management software for use by the state court. Um, provide, it consists of providing computerized maintenance and support of the benchmark court management software awarded to Pioneer Technology Group, LLC, amount not to exceed $750,000, Ms. Horner. I believe this is actually Miss Bell's item. Mary Bell. Oh, okay, great. Yes. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. This is for the case management system that is currently used 
and part of our um, state court for managing citations. Um, I also do have our chief judge on today as well, Chief Judge Purdom, um, as this is part of state court. Um, this is been used here for about the last nine years. And so we will be looking for a contract. Um, this portion here today is for the sole source for the contract that is currently under review with the law department. Okay, so is this a new contractor for this management um, function? No, it, it's a re it would be a renewal. Mm -hmm. and, and then so, did you mention that you are in the process of re-procuring this type of system or the, um, or the support of the system? It's the, por the support for the current system being used. Okay, so um, after that procurement process and when um, this particular contract has expired, you may be before us with a different recommendation, is that right? Um, that is potentially correct, yes. Right. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to understand where we were in that process. Um, uh, Judge Purdom, do you have any comments that you'd like to make either on uh, the maintenance vendor or on the benchmark court case management software? Yeah, this is fundamentally a renegotiation of existing relationships that we think gives us better terms. Thank you very much. And, and the contract is, is subject to minor revision based on the uh, law department's review. We, we've been discussing how uh, we want the contract changed from what Pioneer was proposing. So is the contract before us um, subject to amendment prior to uh, adoption? The contract is not. This is not the stage of the approval of the contract. This is the permission to go sole source. Okay. All right. Um, Commissioner Larry Johnson, do you have any questions? No questions, sir. Um, do any other members of the board have any questions? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. So moved, make them to approve. Okay, the motion is to approve, and Judge Purdom said uh, the selection of uh, a vendor by sole source. And I would second that motion. Um, is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand, say aye. 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 Um, the recommendation of the committee is to approve. Thanks very much, Judge Purdom and Ms. Bell. Um, we appreciate you being here for us. Thank you. Um, the next items on the agenda are discussion items, um, but before we get too far off um, track, uh, Commissioner Johnson, we uh, interviewed um, our uh, candidate, uh, Ms. Freeman, mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that the uh, Board of Commissioners would appreciate a recommendation on us in approving Judge Hargrove's uh, selection. Yes, sir. I'll make a motion that we approve the appointment of G. J. Caroline Freeman as Associate Judge of the Probate Court of DeKalb County, Georgia. Thank you. And I will second that uh, nominate or that uh, recommendation. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hands, say aye. 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 Um, so the recommendation of the uh, committee is to approve the very able uh, Caroline Freeman's nomination as the uh, associate judge of the probate court. That's super um, good capacity and an essential service that the uh, commission um, funds. Um, and I believe that uh, probate court judges are like uh, perhaps were the first officers uh, of the government in DeKalb County, if I remember reading the old historic markers, right? You always had to have a probate court judge to run everything, mm -hmm. and uh, they still do run a lot. Um, so uh, with uh, that business disposed of, um, I would uh, ask Mr. Williams to um, set the table for a presentation on our mid-year budget planning timeline. I apologize. Thank you. Uh, um, Mr. Chair. So actually, Mr. Sigler will be uh, doing the presentation, kind of hit some 
of the high points, some of the conversations that have been had thus far, uh, and put our discussion in context. Um, and much like last year, uh, as we're evaluating the um, needs for mid-year, we're also discussing things in the context of the next ARP tranche. So uh, Mr. Sigler, if you would just kind of walk through the timeline and some of the discussion that we've had this far. Excuse me. Um, thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, and good afternoon to Mr. Chair and the, the members of the committee, uh, the commissioners. Uh, so we've begun our own preparations for the mid-year budget uh, internally in the budget office. That's include, you know, involved doing our projections based on the first quarter expenditures for this year, um, looking at revenues and updating our revenue projections for this year. And um, one thing that we do on an ongoing basis is when the departments contact us and they have a, a question or they're looking for, um, you know, have any issue where they, they think they might need additional funding is we have a running list of those issues um, that we keep um, updated. Um, so we'll be pulling from that um, somewhat. Um, we haven't officially sent out any instructions to any of the departments yet. Um, we've had a few informal conversations either um, where the departments have reached out to us or um, if there was something that, you know, maybe in the, the projections that we wanted to discuss with them, we've reached out to them. Um, so that's, that's basically where we are at this point. We uh, just received the tax digest last week. We're uh, working on our projections or our, our calculations of um, the property tax revenues based on the the tax digest and um and that's that's it in a nutshell um i guess i'll mention that the uh date for the the approval of the millage rates and the the mid-year budget um is july 12th so we will be having um the final public hearing that date um as well as the two other public hearings will be the um prior uh, BOC meeting, which I believe is June 28th. Thank you, Mr. Sigler. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, first of all, obviously our current budgeting environment um, is uh, certainly uh, well informed by resources from the uh, American Recovery Plan. Um, first question is, is that there's been some, I think, uh, um, ambiguity or uh, unclearness about when our uh, second tranche of ARP funds might arrive. And when I was at a NACO meeting, I understood that there is a threshold of the certification of the funds by the local government as being the um, date from which a year is measured from last year to, um, uh, to in order to uh, give us a date to expect those uh, funds this year. Can you tell us when we certified our initial tranche of ARP funding? Uh, I'll, yeah, defer to, to Mr. Williams on that. He's been more heavily involved in the ARP side of. Mm -hmm. uh, right. and, and Commissioner Rader, I don't, I want to say it was around April 26th or somewhere in there. Um, I don't know if uh, Deborah or uh, Diane has the exact date, but the long and short, it is my understanding that that date has passed. We are in constant contact um, with uh, the federal government to find out where we are. We've submitted everything and they say that it's in process. But, uh, you know, I think when they first set the, uh, the law, the rules and the, the program in place, that is what they had anticipated, but we weren't able to even apply because you still have to, you know, apply mm -hmm. um, until maybe a week or so ago, which was after the, uh, the initial date. But it's in process. We, you know, continue to be hopeful, and then within the next couple of weeks, we we see it. I, I, I'm hopeful yeah. that by the time we meet again, we have an agenda item to to book the money. All right, um, and then my second question as it relates to that is obviously with the final rules adoption and um, with uh, the existing uh, provisions in it, 
there is a relatively broad range of purposes to which we can apply this money in our budget process. And then, you know, uh, recently when the board uh, committed to commi uh, committed to uh, devoting a million dollars towards violence reduction, um, we made the policy decision to shift that commitment from right. our fund balance to ARP funding. Right. So what I am wondering is what we are doing in order to consider the needs of the county within the eligibility criteria of ARP to ensure that um, we are taking advantage of those resources in every circumstance where um, it is permitted for us to uh, take that, including the provision that allows us to uh, replace lost uh, revenues um, with ARP funding. Um, it just seems to me that we should not um, lose sight of making you know, a, an informed uh, selection between ARP versus uh, um, local tax funds. And I'd like to know how we're doing that. Excellent question, uh, Commissioner Rader. And that we have some experience with that in that last year, um, although um, it was our first uh, time doing that with the ARP funds, uh, where we realized at that time they were more flexible, quite frankly, than the, the CARES Act funds. So there was a number of um, opportunities to provide funding for uh, backlogs in the courts and other activities that the original CARES Act funds were not um, did not provide for. And it seems that these next funds will even give us more flexibility. So when we are talking with departments um, and constitutionals and asking, you know, what, what are the needs that we need to address, um, we simply take in the need and then we literally look to, you know, or will look, and we have been doing it, you know, we did it uh, even with this past budget, but we will look at the ARP funds, um, see, is it a possibility that we can provide those funds? Is it a short-term activity? Um, um, and then after we go through that evaluation, we see, is it more appropriate for, or we will see, is it more appropriate for ARP funds or uh, general funds, and then we'll make those recommendations. So it's much like what we've done, what we did last year, but I anticipate to, to be even more expansive because I believe that these uh, recovery funds, quite frankly, is what which they're being characterized at, as are going to be more flexible than even the past two years. Okay, well, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the prospects of perhaps even things that we're doing now that are eligible for this funding, mm -hmm. allowing us to be able to um, yeah. pause the, uh, you know, demand on our tax funds budget if those, um, if it's an eligible use, so that, you know, we're actually helping to um, uh, offset other costs. Well, and conserve our reserves, or mm -hmm. to expand our reserves by virtue of being able to use this special funding source, which I believe that at some point, if we don't fully exploit, it's going to go back to the federal government. Sure, and we you're right, and and we will make sure that. Um, any eligible funds that can be allocated, um, you know, whether it's to programming um, by our government or to contracted programming or to um, other relief activities are spent. So we, we have no intention of sending anything back. Um, and we will be looking based on each of the, um, the needs that are presented uh, over the next couple of months um, and even afterwards, but over the next couple of months as we des design and develop the mid-year budget, we're going to be looking to ARP funds first. Okay, so um, I know that our central staff is working with Mr. Sigler and others to try to, you know, develop a framework for um, our receipt and review of that budget, and I think it would be helpful if staff were to work to try to, um, you know, sort of have a um, element of the review that uh, demonstrates that we have fully exploited our ability to replace uh, county tax funded activities with uh, ARP funded activities mm -hmm. um, to the extent that that's possible. I just like to be able to okay. um, to be able to check that off and say we checked on that and this is the amount of money that we can divert from ARP um, versus um, monies otherwise, because sure. if we're able to sell, save tax fund monies, 
then you know those really are the ultimate flexible funds um, so that uh, every time we take the chance to use ARP for a qualified use that may not be um, you know uh, um, as uh, broadly applicable as our tax funds budget then we are able to you know build more uh, flexibility in the rest of our budget absolutely commissioner and what we will do um, and you know we're going to be talking uh, with the central staff um, you know on a lot of budget related issues and and I know the debt uh, policy that uh, will be discussed later um, so we'll just incorporate that into the same conversations mm -hmm. um, and ensure that we're able to when we bring back because there's going to be two deliverables that will be brought back for a vote anyway I mean the mid-year budget of course but and the ARP allocation. So mm -hmm. in those in the context of those discussions, we'll be able to articulate why this is being requested from this funding source. And you know, so I think that's very doable. Okay, good. Um, Commissioner Larry Johnson and then Commissioner Terry. Yeah, that's a question to follow up with that is <clears throat> once you replace the money from the that you were using, uh, that you're going to use, where will that part of money go? So we'll be using it for to pay for our tax money. Do it go back to reserves or do you use that to double quite, up the initiative? Quite, yeah, so I, it depends. You know, I would just say it depends. But we, you know, there is nothing wrong. We're very proud right now to have a two-month reserve. Um, I think we all know that sooner or later there will be uh, an economic downturn and we want to be positioned for that. Um, and so these federal funds allocating those as Commissioner Rader is indicating is uh, you know, uh, a great opportunity to maybe shore up or protect ourselves or hedge quite frankly against future economic downturns. But it depends, Commissioner. There, you know, it does us no good to uh, put money in the bank if the roof is leaking. So if we need to uh, have urgent issues that need to be addressed, that's what we'll do. Um, but you know, where we can create reserves, we'll do that too. And you're gonna look at two types of pots, one for the human infrastructure, one for physical infrastructure. You Absolutely. Commissioner, um, yeah, I, I anticipate any conversations regarding uh, financing or, or you know, I think organization issues, um, at least for the next few years. And I think the discussion in PEX of Grady was a great example of, you know, what is happening in this uh, uh you know, this global labor shortage. Um, so, yeah, we, we will always be looking at not only our our uh, asset, our fixed assets, but our human assets. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Uh, Commissioner Terry. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, one question, one comment. Um, first question is: We did have a discussion, I think, at a few FAB meetings back about just where we are in terms of the current ARP spending and just, you know allocations versus money you know actually dispersed um, i was trying to find any update but i haven't seen an update is there is there an updated spreadsheet uh, we did look at that uh, last meeting and again what we found is that there's still a gap in reporting on those projects that have been uh, approved by either the Board of Commissioners um, through a resolution or potentially by the administration by a commitment to accomplish something where those uh, projects have been committed in some way, but before they the contract or the uh, expenditure actually hits the books. And so it seems as though um, by not reporting those intermediate points, the amount of money that has been committed looks, uh, you know, to be less than what we would hope that it would be. The collateral issue is to shorten the period between commitment and, um, and disbursement. Um, and that's probably the more important um, accomplishment. But um, I know that Ms. McNabb continues to, uh, to work on that. And she circulated to me recently a um, sort of a flow chart on how they make these decisions. But Ms. McNabb, are we any closer to being able to fully um, identify those items where a commitment has been made, but an expenditure has not yet been um, uh, has been formalized um, to reflect that? Or Mr. Williams? Right. And then I'll let uh, 
uh, Ms. McNabb jump in, but you have two different things. Um, this the short answer to your question is yes. Um, as a matter of fact, we're meeting um, uh, every other day uh -huh, on the primarily on these small grants, the, you know, the $10.5 million that were allocated to the board that has been uh, you know, a constant challenge. Um, and we may have some, some solutions to, to move those forward. Um, so that, that's one um, area that has been, quite frankly, the most difficult because it involves a lot of moving parts, not the least of which are these not-for-profits and uh, commission offices as well as our, our internal uh, systems. Um, but as was discussed earlier, I believe in PEX, when we talked about the allocation to the um, uh, CSB, um, you know, there are some that these IGAs with other uh, governmental entities have been easier. Um, and we've presented this in FAB. Uh, I anticipate a presentation in the next week uh, that will give an update, not only of, of you know, the larger expenditures, but equally not important. I don't want to use that word, but uh, these these smaller grants uh, that commissioners' offices have uh, allocated. Um, I think we'll be able to to show some progress on that in the very near future. Um, but here's here's something an interesting conversation I had earlier today um, with some of these larger allocations. Um, in, in some instances you may have agencies who've had difficulty hiring. So they've been allocated the money, um, but, you know, and they have certain programs that they're anticipating doing, but you, it requires personnel. Uh, and so we will be revisiting some of those to ensure that uh, one, we still wanna do whatever was being prescribed and two, that there's sufficient funding to hire the personnel necessary. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Terry, so, anything else? Well, yeah, just, uh, I just want to follow up on the question because I think I heard that there was a spreadsheet, but I still haven't and seen that, it. So okay. is that, are we well, going to we'll, we'll, we, we, we can email it to you. We, we presented at the last tab. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll, All we'll right, email so, you that one. But so what I was saying though, Commissioner Terry, is we're going to have an updated one that will hopefully show progress on a lot of the smaller, uh, well, on everything, but specifically the smaller contracts that $10.5 million commission money. But we, okay. we presented a number of times in that. I think once a month we presented. Yeah, I mean, it was the most recent version was last meeting of the committee. But again, we're trying to get the department to more fully um, uh, detail out commitments that have been made either by us or by the administration mm -hmm. that are now in process so that we know how much has actually been committed even though it isn't expended. Um, for instance, you know, uh, on that last spreadsheet, it showed about 10% of the commission directed funds had been um, expended and one might derive the um, inference that there was 90% left of it to commit. Got it. In fact, that's not the case. Right. Um, there are many commitments that have been made and validated by a vote of the board um, that haven't hit that bottom line and to the extent that we can um, put them on the map, um, that's going to help us to better understand first where we're putting our commitments and that'll help our um, constituents to understand how we're managing their resources. And then secondarily, it will help us to better appreciate you know, what's left to go down. Excellent. So, so we'll have in that respect specifically is the list of every item that the board has voted on and exactly where it is. Mm -hmm. And then if you also have a similar list for commitments that the administration has made mm -hmm. um, that you know did not require a vote of the board, I think that that would be very useful for us too because it may well be that some of the things that we're thinking of, you know, we may have missed the administration's movement in that direction. And so I think that would also be very useful in terms of if you've got a fence around a piece of money because of a particular purpose, let us know so that we're not trying to fence off the same territory. Do the same thing. Understood. Yeah, and, and that's what I want to make my comment about because, you know, and I want to speak up in defense of the commissioners here um, because I really feel that the commissioners are part of this governing authority and right. that in a lot of ways, our nose is closer to the grindstone than a department head 
or even the CEO or even a chief of whatever department or whatever agency, um, we, we are on the front lines of every problem in DeKalb County. And Zach gets every email, the CEO gets every email, and we get every email. And then there's a lot of things that, quite frankly, don't make it up the chain, but we just hear about, because the nature, I think, of what we do, whether it's land use and zoning, we're always talking to our constituents every two months in a very personal way about things that impact them directly. And then I think that, for the most part, people do believe that the commissioners are you know, despite our organizational act, I think they think that we can, you know, wave the wand and make things happen when clearly that there's a process that's be gone through that. Now, when it comes to the ARP in particular, the the commissioners are given the allocation and 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 what I've seen is a lot of really good projects, but they're projects to a large extent that are you know, what can be described as parochial con, you know, they're they're about what's happening in, in that district. Sure. Like just that district alone. But the rest of the fu funds, I think, ostensibly are for countywide initiatives. And I think the way that it, the budget has been presented, at least the first tranche of the budget, is commissioners, you take your pot and go do your thing. Mm -hmm. And then the majority of it, the administration will handle. And what, what happened last year is we were just given something and we tried to pick, pick around the edges, but we reacted to something. And what I just really think that we should do is just have this, it's, I mean, it's basically a strategic planning process. You know, the administration is asking every single department and judge and everything for their ideas, but then they don't ask us. You're, you're missing a piece of the governing authority. And it's not like we're trying to like control everything. It's just that, you know, we all have blind spots. And if we only react to what is, I think, you know, someone cooks up in a room somewhere without everyone at the table, then you know someone's either going to be on the menu or someone's going to be left out of the menu. So, can I offer something? Okay. All right, Ms. Williams. And, and then, okay, and, and your your points are are absolutely valid, uh, Commissioner Terry, um, because it is a a function of all of us together. And you know, as we are preparing to get the next tranche, maybe the Fab uh, Committee or some other committee or however it's done much like when we do the regular budget says here are things that we would like to see or here's something that we're, we're interested in or something along those lines i mean this is all new to us but um you know we do it with the regular budget um and you know uh, an opportunity to, to input into the process i mean i'm, I'm making it up as i go but I'm, I'm receiving what you're saying and saying all right how can we make something happen so that you know there is no one who feels that they're on the menu or whatever, you know, what you just said. That everyone's part of the, you know, here's what we want to do collectively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it just, it seems like that, I mean, that makes sense. I like that idea. It seems like the committees will propose ideas and then it just goes into the administration room and then y'all hash out what you bring back to us. Well, I can only speak to the budget. Everything that was requested in the budget made it to the budget. Okay, so let me bring this back to a discussion of the budget planning timeline, and let me make a couple observations. One is that the last time that we accepted these funds, we accepted the grant, and then we appropriated the entire grant, mm -hmm. which then um, gave the administration authority to um, spend those funds consistent with the constraints on the grant. Correct. Um, if we want a more stepwise process, the action that we would take would be to accept the grant and reserve those funds for appropriation. Um, that is a, can be a burdensome process, but it also uh, certainly can, um, you know, uh, foster uh, dialogue on prioritization, that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. However, notwithstanding that, um, we do have a central staff, and I'm going to ask them to briefly discuss um, what they're doing uh, to uh, prepare to support the commission's uh, review and um, consideration of the um, mid-year budget. And then uh, to the extent that there is anything different related to how we might be looking at the ARP um, allocation, uh, maybe you could speak to that also. 
Um, and Dr. Obang, if you want to identify somebody that might be able to just briefly tell us how y'all are getting ready for mid-year and then how you might be able to support us in the other area, that would be useful. Yes, sir. So um, I'm going to call on uh, either John or Marcus. We've all kind of been working on it. And they can share the screen. John, are you good? Okay, there you go. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, commissioners, and FAB committee. Um, Central staff has developed a schedule for potential extra special call meetings to discuss budget issues with the Board of Commissioners. Um, we have shared this plan with uh, the administration and Director Sigler. Um, what we tried to do is just develop something that um, would allow us to have extra conversations if there was a need for it. And so July 12th is the, is that what the administration is expecting? Is a July 12th omnibus budget amendment? Sorry, I just chimed in there, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct, right, TJ? Right, yeah, that's the date that we're looking to um, pass the budget. So is there any comments from the uh, commissioners? You as committee chairs will be asked to um, undertake these additional meetings um, and want to make sure that um, you're supportive of this process and of the time necessary in order to get ahead of this budget process so that uh, we can make informed de decisions that are informed not only by our own review, but by recommendations from the committees. Uh, Commissioner Terry. Uh, yes, I we have... Uh... We didn't do our public safety budget presentations before the budget. Everyone heard me talk about it. Um, and I know central staff has already just went ahead and said, we'd like to do those public safety presentations for, and, and you know, for the first time really um, before the mid year. So I'm just, um, I'd like to get some confirmation that that's, I know, I know that central staff has already put that out there for a few months now. So, I'd love to get some confirmation that we're going to do it because what happened last time is we got jammed up, ran out of time, and then no one's even, I mean, let's be honest, like you could look at the spreadsheet of the public safety budget and you can look at the presentation, but we never actually talked about what's in the public safety budget. And as the ERPS committee chair, I, I really think that we should do that. So... Uh... Mr. Williams, Dr. Obang. Yes. So, um, like uh, Mr. Williams was saying, part of what we've actually talked about, and again, this will also include the debt policy. All of us are planning on sitting at a table and actually addressing a lot of the questions that we have ahead of time, so that when we have these meetings, there's less conversation about what's what, and then we can actually present a final product product that actually can have more substantive uh, conversations. So. Um, we are planning on having more conversations ahead of time once it's released to actually sit at the table and kind of hash out some of our concerns once we've been doing our own reviews like we've been doing before. Okay, thank you. I don't know if there was anything else you wanted to add to that. No, I mean, conversations. Right, we'll, we'll Commissioner, um, um, sorry, uh, Dr. Obang and, and Commissioner Terry, we're, we're ready. Um, so. All right, let's do it. Date, we'll, we'll get a date scheduled and we'll be there. Okay, good, I think we got a pretty full schedule there. So it looks like we have a couple options to pick from in the next month. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair just had one other question. Yes. So or it's, it's kind of a question comment, but in terms of the, you know, the public hearing aspect, the public, you know, sort of input process, um, I really think that we ought to be doing some of these budget meetings in either different formats, certainly different times. I don't think it's fair that we have two budget hearings at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday and expect anyone's really going to participate with any sort of substance. And it's, it's not clear whose responsibility is it because to you know a large extent, the budget is the CEO's budget, but it always gets put back on the commissioners to approve it. 
And 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 I'm and I personally am caught in a position of I have to go out and explain this budget that quite frankly I had nothing to do with. Um, and it's almost like, oh well, commissioner, you can go out and do meetings with your constituents about the budget, and we'll invite speakers to come on. But it's not clear that even that is designed for input. It's almost just designed for we're just going to tell you what we're doing. And so I don't. I'm not saying I have a solution for it. I mean, I probably do have a solution for it. But the bottom line is, I think that we need to do a little bit more work to explain what we're spending the money on in a way that isn't just like, here, read this 300 page document of spread, you know, spread spreadsheet. Um, usually there's some sort of budget explainer primer. Um, the last two, I think, have been very, it's like been a page. And or it didn't you know, just talk about one thing and then didn't talk about anything else. And I just think that, you know, whether it's the FAB committee, and I guess I mean, I'm sure the individual committees can do this on their sort of portion of the budget. Um, but if people don't really know what we're voting on and don't really understand what we're spending their tax money on, then it just becomes harder to sort of justify future spending on things. And I think just the basic concept of a taxpayer receipt um uh, a, a more clear transparent way to just show par, uh, pie charts and bar graphs of what we're spending money on is just an, an easy way to further articulate that there's a lot of really great things we're doing in the county but we sort of hide it in these long spreadsheets and different funds and it you know you really get kind of like like you could be like a data scientist sometimes to track where what everything is doing and they're moving around and and so i mean if commissioners kind of don't quite understand what's happening how can the public fully understand it so i guess what i'm asking for is just a little bit more creativity on how we present the budget providing different times so they're more accessible you know something that's a little bit more i think in the spirit of what the whole public hearing requirement and law is i think a lot of times governments just sort of check the box we had a public hearing so therefore we're good i think the intent of that is to actually get feedback from our constituents and stakeholders and then be open to changing the budgets based on that feedback I, it's just you know anyway I'll just so what i'm going to ask uh, commissioner terry is that central staff go to all the board members um, ask them for input on uh, process and presentation tools and that type of a thing and then for them to get back and work with Mr. Sigler to see if we can uh, deliver on those expectations from um, every member of the Board of Commissioners so that, you know, we have something that meets uh, their needs for, uh, you know, presentation or for analysis, um, but uh, also working within the constraint of, um, you know, uh, the time available and the collaborative um, process that we want to maintain with the administration. Can I add to that? Yes. I just want to thank this, our central staff because they've met with me and we are determining what departments may want to come forward uh, to have a meeting. I just don't want to have a meeting to have a meeting. So uh, they're going to let me know uh, what the who may want to come before us. And I think you all, I think they're setting a threshold of anybody asking for 5% more or something like that and uh, working to bring them forward uh, as we go and do it. But I think the main increases are gonna come because of the ARP funding, not maybe the general funds that, that we're facing with. So that's that might need to be a, uh, the main discussion points on adding that funding uh, to certain departments and how it's gonna be directed. So I look forward to the discussion and as we move forward, because time moves so quick in June, there's so much going on. So it, it's going to be, and, and people not paying attention more. So it's the summertime, it's hot spring, you know, summer's here. So it's a, it's just a lot to try to keep people engaged with just the budget process as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on uh, that process? All right, uh, then I guess it's time to move back to our debt refunding. There was much made last week on our savings from the um, uh, from using the WIFIA funds, and uh, certainly 
appreciate that. But when I reduced those savings that were uh, going to be accrued over the life of those loans, uh, when I reduced those to net present value, I noted that they uh, that savings was uh, in excess of what we have foregone in savings um, between October and now for the refunding of our existing debt. Um, and now we're in a high interest rate situation. Um, I'm concerned that that money is gone forever. Can someone speak to me about um, where we are with refunding our existing watershed debt? So, Commissioner Ra Raider, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what you're expecting in this presentation, but as it relates to that very specific question, we're in the process of uh, developing a, uh, an instrument that can be used for a competitive evaluation. Um, so we have uh, developed um, you know, a scope of work, um, uh, an evaluation interest instrument. Um, ultimately, the CEO will make the determination um, how we move forward, but we will be prepared to uh, you know, do a version of well, it'd be an open competitive process, but it would not be an RFP. That's what we're preparing. Um, so that's what we're in the possession of. We've not made a final determination as to, you know, if and when we will put that on the street, but that's uh, what the team has been working on over the past few weeks. And I think that the final documents will be probably completed, completed over the next couple of days. All right. Well, um, I, uh, I, Central staff is gonna be interested in that. I have asked them to review our uh, um, debt management policy to see if there are improvements that can be made so that we aren't doing this now six months after we were eligible for refunding. Um, and ideally we would have been ready to pull that trigger um, last October when we had very favorable interest rates. Um, you know, we just need to get a, uh, ahead of these issues a lot more. So um, I, uh, and I don't know Mr. Allen or uh, Mr. Um, Manson, if y'all wanna speak to this at all, but um, we are going to be reviewing some potential amendments to the debt management policy that we want to, um, uh, to consider before the Board of Commissioners. I think Commissioner Terry has his hand up. Okay, oh, uh, Commissioner Terry, can we deal with this first or do you have something that you want to speak to? Yeah, it's uh, on, on this issue that we're talking about. Okay, well, first let's hear what Mr. Uh, Allen has to say because okay. I think it'll be of interest to you. And then, you know, you might uh, respond to that. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners and uh, everyone involved. Uh, so staff has been working with... Uh, within ourselves as, as well as within the administration to develop a means by which we put all this uh, this process in context, um, not only from the point in time where the uh, opportunity presented itself uh, for the refinancing of the bonds, but uh, where, where we can go as far as the road ahead as it relates to a process by which the board can be more involved and the governing authority is to be more involved as a whole. Uh, so what we're planning to do is share a memo that staff has drafted and that we've been in constant communication with uh, several parties on. We'll send that out to the whole board uh, by end of day today. And by the next FAB meeting, uh, Mr. Chair would like, we can discuss this in detail, discuss the recommendations uh, provided within, uh, and essentially the main point is that we have taken all of the commissioner's uh, points of view as it relates to uh, ways in which we could structure the expectations so that uh, you know, there is no potential lost time or you know, present value savings as you stated, Commissioner Rader, and put it within a structure and a process that we can utilize uh, going forward. So whether we're having uh, you know, continual discussions in FAB committee or discussions amongst the board in general, where we actually review the debt management policy, um, all the way to, you know, just getting more of the board's uh, input so that we can move forward collaboratively 
uh, with the administration as it relates to this. So we'll be sending out this, uh, this memo. I think it's about seven or eight pages. Uh, the first four to five pages really outline the story and how we've gotten to where we are today uh, as it began in November of 2021 um, with that potential opportunity to some of the FAB meetings that we had in March and April, where this was discussed more in detail and, uh, you know, I plan it forward. Mr. Chair, if I can add to that, um, after drafting the policy, what one thing that we always want to make sure of is that, you know, we're, we're kind of just doing it from an academic standpoint. So we wanted to sit down with the finance department as well as the administration to be able to determine if our policies and our strategies are actually executionable and then really come to a, a happy medium as to how we can move forward with the process and then present that to the board as a whole once we determine how we can we can uh, kind of mitigate the concerns of the commissioners that have been articulated. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Terry. Yeah, so it, am I understanding that we are, as a board of commissioners, are working on a debt policy? We have a debt management policy. A debt management policy. However, our debt management policy did not um, uh, stimulate timely consideration of the refunding of our um, existing watershed debt at a point at which interest rates were at historic lows. And now much of the savings that we would have accrued have eroded away. And so one of the things that we want to do is to look at ways that we can make sure that we're ready to catch that ball when it is pitched to us um, and act in a timely fashion consistent with um, the appropriate role of the administration in making that decision. But regrettably, over the past year, the uh, the uh, decision not to make a decision has resulted in considerable expense. Okay, well, I don't understand what what is what is it about the current debt management policy that prevents us? I mean, I just feel like the policy should be save money, right? And then number two is let's do it. And so, what well, about this current money management see, policy prevents this? Yeah, I think that if you will take a look at both the existing policy as well as the paper that has been prepared you'll kind of see some of the things that are necessary to undertake, uh, you know, to make sure that we don't miss any opportunities. Okay, but I just heard the COO say that they're doing something different. Is it still within the current policy? Or are we trying to pass a policy now so that we can address the issue of the debt, re debt refinancing right now? Or is this a future thing we're gonna be dealing with? Mr. Williams. All right, so Commissioner Terry, what I was, uh, speaking to was in um, uh, comports with the existing policy. It was, it was within the confines of the existing policy. Okay. All right. Well, then there, I mean, it sounds like we could have, we didn't have to wait six months or eight months. I mean, it sounds like there, it, where there's a will, there's a way. And I just, I don't understand. I mean, it's just like, I was one of the people back in the fall, just, hey, shouldn't we be looking at this? And I'm not on the FAB committee, but I remember hearing several times we're looking into it and I just, I just i just don't understand why would we be so opposed to saving money it just seems like it's just such such an obvious thing to do and even when we were getting indications that interest rates were going to go up we still didn't act and i mean now we're it's clearly going up and it's clearly going up like probably over the next several months if not year i don't know uh, but it's just, you know, being, but I guess, is it, is it possible that we were just waiting? We were like hope, waiting for something to happen that didn't happen. I just, I'm, I'm trying to understand the rationale and the decision-making tree that goes into, we will wait until X point to do, to act. And I don't, I just don't know how we arrived at this point. Who are you directly? Anyone who will answer. I just don't know anything. I didn't know. I mean, I don't know what the decision making process is. So I just don't even know what, what question to ask. All I know is that we could have saved money and we, we have, we've waited so long that now we have not saved a lot of money. I think we still can save some money. I think the interest rates, I thought they were like at 8% or something. So there's still a window there, right? Did you say 8%? I thought weren't the original bonds 8%? Is that wrong? No, no, I, I don't know. Um, so, right, Commissioner. Uh, Terry, and we'd be happy to sit and go through all of this with you. 
the decision is not whether we want to save money or not save money. We want to save money, which was demonstrated uh, consistently over the past number of years, whether it was uh, the WIFIAs that we've got in the GIFA. Um, what we also want to do is ensure that when we make decisions on how to move forward, it is um, you know, something that is, for lack of a better word, above reproach. And so as we have been looking at um, a competitive process, um, and maybe that is the best way to, to move forward, um, you know, we keep all of that in mind. We'd be happy to, to sit and share with you how we've gotten to here, but at no point did we say, let's not save money, um, but we are balancing, um, you know, when we make decisions, we want it to be fully informed, to comport with policy and to, um, you know, to take all of those things into account. All right, I would love to have a meeting to understand that. I mean, maybe I'm a new commissioner and everyone else is totally great with what we're doing. Maybe there's other commissioners that are having meetings about this, I don't know. Seems like it would be a, 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 good, a good of the whole conversation, but if it's just me getting the briefing, I guess that's fine. Right. right. So our only conversations have been in this context. We've not had individual meetings on this. All right, but we're the ones who have to ultimately vote on this, right? Absolutely. Once we present something, we haven't yeah. been in a position to present okay. it. All right. Well, I mean, this is just what I'm talking about is like me and I assume maybe one or two other commissioners have asked about this for months now and and there haven't been any of these detailed briefings and but we still have we still have to vote on it so it's like it's it's just the process of we only can react to whatever you give us and if we don't get information it's just like do we just do we just keep waiting for it or do we just assume it's just like a certain point we're just not going to respond to that request and Hope so that here's, someone forgets about it. I, you know, I just, here's what I would say on this on this specific thing. Um, we will be presenting, you know, based on the existing policy, which is what we are working with. Mr. Rader said at the outset that uh, the central staff will be working um, with with us to maybe revisit that. Um, but the way the policy is currently written, um, that's the process we're going through. We could change the policy to say and do something different. Um, and that you know that that's completely within the purview of the of the governing authority, the board initially. Um, but where we are now, I think we would be happy to kind of lay that out um, so that from here on out, everyone can follow along. I guess that's the best way I can say. It. Okay, all right. Well, but in just a last question, so is is the finance department in favor of us changing the debt management policy, or is the current one sufficient? I don't. I don't. Yeah, that would we've depend been on that. what proposed changes were right. made. Right. You know, I mean, we don't have a uh, recommendation at this point. So, um, again, I think that uh, this probably learning curve would be better climbed um, in a more interactive um, venue than this. But, uh, you know, Commissioner Terry, I welcome uh, your efforts uh, to help us improve the process. I'll be happy to improve the process. I don't know the process, though. Is my, that's my main point. Well, that I actually don't was, know the process. The memo circulated will be useful in that regard. Yeah. Furthermore, there was a memo um, that was circulated previously uh, that covered the existing debt management policy from the law department, as well as the application of certain elements of that policy to the decision to... Um, uh, to solicit uh, a private placement of new debt. So, um, you know, uh, it may be that staff could put that into your hands again, along with the current memo um, to give you a little bit more information on those issues. I mean, it's complex stuff. I don't disagree that this is, you know, kind of a, uh, a very, um, convoluted area, but it doesn't mean that it's not important to act nimbly and to strike when rates are low. And that's what we're hoping to improve our ability to do. Um, commissioners, is there anything else to this point? You'll be receiving a memo from central staff from today. And then I think that it would be important for them to perhaps 
put together a folder for each of us on um, you know these debt issues um, so that we can start to make some uh, informed evaluations and decisions on improvements. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Marita Davis Johnson has her hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, that yellow thing in the corner looks just like. I know. <laughs> right? I know. It's the same with me when I'm looking at it, my hands up. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, get that information because there are complex issues and there's not, uh, you know, hindsight is everything, you know. But, uh, you know, we have to look at all aspects of uh, what we're doing. We talk about transparency, transparency and procedure, you know, and so we have to see where everything fits in for us to make informed decisions. So I think that once we look at the process to determine if, in fact, the process need to be improved, I mean, you just can't say that because we missed um, you know, because we had another point in time where we could have saved money. That's not the entire process. We all want to save money, but you have to look at things comprehensively and not um, in a vacuum. And so uh, I look forward to, to moving forward, but I will not concede uh, right now that changes need to be made. But once we look at it, I will say, if in fact changes uh, can be made to improve uh, the entire um, uh, procedure, then we should take that in consideration. You know, um, like I said, it's very complex. It's not one issue in a vacuum. And um, so we have to take that in consideration as well and look at what happened and what possibly could have happened uh, based upon a comprehensive look at all, um, at all parts. So, I mean, that's just, that's my comment. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, I think that that exhausts our agenda for today. So if there's nothing else to come before us, I'd entertain a motion to uh, adjourn. So moved. Second, all in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. Aye. We're adjourned, thank you. <laughs>